Kia ora koutou. we're going to get started because we've got a lot to fit in this morning. I'm delighted to welcome Tim Sherratt, the Associate Professor of Digital Heritage at the University of Canterbury, a historian. I wish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> University of Canberra. Close. You can see what I did there. Um, <laughs> come to New Zealand. Um, <laughs> Jeff is from University of Canterbury. Um, he's a historian, a hacker, um, and he also research researches the possibilities and politics of digital cultural collections, and he's also a seasoned presenter here at NDF and spoke as a keynote in 2012, um, and it's so great to have you back, Tim. So come on up and tell us about data and stories and Lod Book 3. Is that how you say it? Uh, thanks, Fee. Um, and of course, um, again, I said yesterday, I'm glad to be back, and I always love coming to NDF. It is one of my, no, it is my favourite conference uh, around the world. Um, so yeah, in um, in 2012, um, it was actually a keynote. It was a little thing we did. I did with Chris McDowell, um, where the NDF uh, organisers challenged us to make things and present them on stage, um, and. Uh, and I did. I made a, a hacky demo of, uh, of how narrative text could be enriched using linked open data. And it was riffing off some stuff that Chris had done and John Voss, the keynote the previous year, had done um, around linked open data. So that was 2012. Um, and I've made several attempts at taking this further in the years since. Um, but, uh, you know, most of which I've sort of given up on. Um, but the latest version? is shaping up okay, and, uh, and I still think it's important, so I thought it was a, a good time to sort of bring it back to where it started here at NDF and talk about where it's at. And I suppose, you know, this, this is also my little reminder that not all data has to be big. Um, not every digital project has to finish in a sprint. Um, it's a story of small, simple technologies and slow-burning passions. Okay, well, let's just start by stating the obvious, right? Linked open data is about making connections. There's the connections between things, so relationships between people or between a person and a place, um, the subject of a photograph, all expressed in a nice structured standard form. And that's the, the linked part of linked open data, right? But there's also the connections between the people and organisations that create linked open data and those who use, enrich, or explore that data. And that's sort of like the open part of linked open data, right? The shareability. And I think it's fair to say that, that more effort has been put into the connections between things than the connections between projects, users, and audiences. And interestingly, both these types of connections are dependent upon context for their full richness and meaning. You know, the fact that two people know each other, um, or that a person was in a, a particular place at a particular time, gains meaning uh, within the context of a specific story or argument or narrative. And likewise, what we share and how we actually share it depends on the sorts of audiences and the collaborators that we want to connect with. It's the specific contextual character of these connections that really interests me. So how can we explore linked open data within the context of a particular narrative, a particular story? How can we use linked open data to connect to different audiences, to expand the reach of our research and our collections? Rather than you know, large scale production of linked open data data sets, I'm interested in this small scale creation and consumption uh, in capturing pockets of, of interest and expertise, in sharing what we know. So I'm a historian, right? Um, and my argument uh, is that historians make linked open data all the time, they just don't know it. Um, you know. Think of a, a normal historical research process. 
you're gathering information about people and places and events and sources, and you're going to great lengths to try and understand and define and document the relationships between all those sorts of things. But then we get to that process, which for some reason we call writing up. Um, and in that process of writing up, that data gets squeezed out. Right? All the richness of those relationships and, and, and those uh, that, that you've documented sort of get chucked out as you gradually build your story. I mean, you may glimpse their sort of ghostly remnants in a footnote, um, but that's about it. And in a way, that's a good thing, right? Because that's part of the skill of being a historian, is being able to take all that, that mess of data, all those relationships, all those things, and create a compelling narrative from that, to be able to put that in the form of a story which communicates something significant to your audience. But why can't we have both? Why can't we have the story and the data? And that's really what this is all about. James Minahan was the Melbourne-born son of a Chinese father and white Australian mother. When he was five, James's father took him to China. When he returned uh, to Australia 26 years later, he was arrested and declared a prohibited immigrant under the white Australia policy. But was James really an immigrant under the law? He'd been born in Australia. The case ended up in the High Court of Australia and continues to have resonance, resonances today when, of course, we're still having these questions and debates about who belongs. Kate Bagnall, my partner in many things, um, recently published an account of, James, of the James Minahan count, uh, case in the journal History Australia. Um, but you know, the story is, is so rich in detail, and, and in order to actually have it accepted in a, in a you know, conventional academic journal, Kate had to cut back on the narrative parts and boost the theory parts uh, in order to get it in. Um, so we're working on uh, another version of this story, a logbook version, which puts back all of Kate's narrative and adds in much more in terms of people, places, relationships, and resources. So let's have a little look. Um, as the theme of this talk is, is um, you know, basically, why haven't I done more over the years since 2012? Um, you know, this, this is all sort of unfinished. It's a very rough demo, um, but hopefully it gives you a bit of a sense of what we're trying to aim at. Um, you'll see at the bottom of all these pages a little note saying it's going to be published completely in September 2018. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're, we're uh, keeping up there with our, um, our total uh, missing of all of our deadlines in this project. Okay, so anyway, it doesn't look very exciting. I mean, it's basically just text and that's deliberate. You know, I want to focus on the text to be central to the, to the, uh, the experience. Um, and as you scroll down the page, little things wobble and do stuff. Um, And if you happen to sort of uh, mouse over the various names which you see, you see the little thingies are wobbling over there as well. So you're getting a sense there's a relationship here happening between the text and what else is going on. And hopefully it's encouraging you to start to explore. Um, and so if you click on one of those links, we get a little box. Um, and same sort of thing. You could do the same sort of thing over here as well. Um, and... Um, so we've got people and places, and eventually, if playing around, you'll probably notice that um, uh, some of the things, the colours represent different things. So uh, we've got people, and we've got a place here. Um, different sorts of resources. When you click on a footnote, we get a nice footnote. You click on the link, and we actually get the resource that's referred to in the footnote. Um, all of these, of course, link through to other more details about those things. So we click on there, we get lots more information about James Minahan. We start to see the sort of uh, detail in terms of relationships. 
uh, within this story and of course you can navigate any of those relationships to see who more about that sort of person. We see the, the, the resources, the documents that have been used in the story and where they refer to parts of James's story, uh, case. Um, and um, you've also got, going back the other way, we came from the narrative through to the, the data, but of course we've got here, you can see where that particular person is mentioned within the narrative text and you can jump back the other way to see where that, the context of that is. So the aim is to start building up that sort of relationship between the conventional narrative text and the data underneath. That sort of enables you to move fairly easily um, uh, between the two and to explore the relationships that are there. If you just want to read the text, you can just read the text. If you want to dive in uh, and follow the relationships, you can. Of course, there are various ways that you can then start to navigate that. So um, you can just have a list of the various types of things um, so the various resources that are used in this. Um, and again, which, uh, so this is a particular document from the, uh, high, uh, produced by the High Court of Australia in the National Archives. Um, and it gives you information about its context in the archives. So you can follow to see what file that was in and things like that. Or you could look for other things which the uh, from the National Archives of Australia that are used within that, uh, this, uh, this resource. Um, so it's also an interface to the, the different types of institutions which have contributed material to the resource. Um, so yeah, so they have fairly conventional sorts of lists, um, but you could also view it other ways. So we could just throw everything onto a big wall. Um, so these are all the different types of things which are, uh, are currently in there. Um, the people and the places and the events and everything, still lots to put in. Um, so you can just sort of navigate it that way as well. And of course, you can just fairly easily throw the places onto a, a map uh, and see what we've got going on here. Melbourne, not very exciting. OK. Um, and the relationships even between the places, between the big places and little places and containing. So yeah, I won't go on. But you understand that, that you've got that sort of network of, 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 of entities, of people and places which are sitting underneath there. And you've got the narrative text sitting on top. Now, what's also going on is all that information is being provided out to the world in a nice structured format as linked open data. So as an interface, it's just something that people can use. But of course, um, for something that is, uh, we also want to provide something that, that computers can understand, can read. Um, and on the bottom of every page, you, well, the, the data's all in there, so you can click on there. It's sort of a little, little, little um, API pretend API, uh, in terms of delivering the, 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 uh, the structured data within that page. It's also embedded within the page itself, but available as a separate file. But you could just put .json on the end of every page, uh, in every URL, and get the JSON uh, structured data out of that thing as well. OK, so that's the little demo. Um, and. I won't do it now, but if you take one of those pages and feed it to, there's a thing called the structured data linter, uh, which extracts structured data from a web page. So if you feed one of those URLs to the structured data linter, you get back a long list of the things and their relationships and their properties, just to prove that all that data is actually sitting in just that normal old page. Now, obviously, yes, our September deadline has gone, but we're still aiming to get that version in uh, of, of uh, James Minahan. Um, also working on some other things, so I'm involved with a project on aviation heritage at the moment, um, and uh, one of our outputs from that will be a, a, a log book uh, relating to the history of civil aviation in Australia, and that'll be pretty cool because it's you know relationships between places, airfields, and and aeroplanes. Aeroplanes have really good identifiers. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> um, so we can start to sort of look at where airplanes were and who owned them and did all that sort of stuff, which will be fun. Um, now, since 2012, um, you know, one of the reasons why I haven't done more, this is my excuse, that's why I'm late with my homework, um, is that I sort of assumed that, that, you know, it was such an obvious thing to do that somebody with more money and better programming skills would actually do something much more exciting uh, and interesting, you know, so why should I invest too much time? And certainly there have been some interesting developments um, since, since 2012. Um, and you've got, you know, new platforms for publishing which embed all sorts of new possibilities, things like Scalar and Manifold in particular. Um, Mecha S, I mean, I assume you've all heard of a Mecha, but a Mecha S 
uh, the S for semantic. Um, ads is a new version which came out uh, this year um, and adds a whole lot of uh, great abilities within a mecha to not just upload items but to define relationships between them using standardized vocabulary. So basically to produce linked open data you can get the output out um, as, uh, as JSON-LD which is uh, a structured way of, of um, sharing uh, linked open data. The one down the bottom there is really interesting, Dokili. Um, which uh, is uh, uh, basically very, an editor for creating text with linked open data. So it sort of does some of the things that I want to do, but not quite. Um, but it's still something to certainly keep an eye on if you're interested in this space. Um, really, you know, it's not that I want more, it's really just that I want less. I, I, I just want simple. <laughs> um, and that's been one of the motivating things throughout this. And I set myself some basic ground rules back in 2012 uh, around using simple tools. Um, and that's still really important to me, you know, the fact that you can create linked open data without a triple store. Um, and what you're seeing here in this demo is just static HTML pages with a bit of JavaScript bells and whistles on top, right? There's nothing fancy about it. Um, uh, so it's really just a, a case of, um, it's using these particular tools. Um, uh, you basically start with some data, uh, and that could come from anything really. It could come out of a mecha S, it could come out of a triple store, as so I can get it out in, in JSON LD and then do a bit of manipulation and load it up. Uh, at the moment, the stuff for James Minahan is sitting in the series of Google Sheets um, as Kate's sort of continuing to update it, um, and I just sort of run a script to pull that out and get it ready and plug it in. Um, JSON LD, as I said, is a, is a, um, a way of sharing. Um, linked open data using JSON, which is a way of, of sharing uh, data in uh, text formats, which developers are all very used to. So it's a, a very convenient way. And that's probably been the most significant thing which has changed since 2012, has been the sort of development and uptake of JSON LD as a way of sharing and embedding uh, linked open data. So the, the data for this, you know, if you want to, you can just create it in a text editor um, as a, a YAML file, which is another way of representing data in a text file. So the idea, you know, basically you could do all this just with a text editor. Um, uh, and of course then you have your text itself um, and you can use a tool like Pandoc to take your Word document, just run it out, get it as in a markdown format, which is a, a text format. And then you just um, define your relationships between your narrative text here and your data file by, there's some little tags in that text there which sort of look like that. Um, then you feed your text and your data to a static site generator called Jekyll. So that just takes all that stuff and spits out a whole lot of HTML pages. Um, so I've created a plugin which takes that data file, it creates an HTML page for everything in that data file, and defines all the relationships between the different bits and pieces. Um, and then there's a, a Jekyll theme that I've uh, created which does the sort of uh, you know, JavaScript doodads, all the things that wobble and do stuff on the page. Um, but there's no reason why you have to have that theme. You know, in the end, uh, um, at the moment they're all sort of lumped together, but in the end that should be separate. You know, the, 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 uh, the plugin that creates the relationships and the documents should be separate from the way you actually represent that. You don't have to have wobbling balls if you don't want wobbling balls. Um, that sounded much ruder than I expected. <laughs> um, as I said, the result is just plain old HTML that you can upload to any web server. Um, and the data is embedded within those pages as JSON-LD. So no databases, no platforms. Um, and this is really important to me in terms of preservation and sustainability. Um, you can zip up the whole thing, plonk it in your repository, um, and then you know, sometime later somebody can unzip it, open it up, and it'll work. Um, I'll save you from the story of Logbook 2. You might be wondering about what happened to Logbook 2. It's gone missing in action. Uh, basically because I tried to sort of adopt the new coolness uh, in terms of building it in Angular uh, and um, ended up in a totally space that I didn't want in terms of the, the, the ability to sustain and preserve it. Okay, but wrapping up. There's a question here, an important question here, and that's the why bother question. I mean, why would a historian, I mean, you have to put a bit more work in here, right, to, to make sure you've got your data in a form that you can plug it in and do all that sort of stuff. Um, and why would why would a historian bother with that? You know, when they can just sort of submit their article to a journal and uh, get their brownie points, and you know that's all good. Um, so, what's in it for historians? I mean, 
uh, why should they care about linked open data? And perhaps the answer to that is they shouldn't care about linked open data. Um, the linked open data should support them to do new and interesting things, not the other way around. Um, so for a historian, the point of something like logbook is not to create linked open data, because why would they want to do that, but to expose their research in interesting ways. Um, ways that bring the, the richness and complexity of the work that they do to the foreground, that offers new opportunities for engagement and new audiences. The linked open data is just built in, just added bonus. And of course, there's the preservability that I mentioned before, that your data and your text stay together. Um, but there's a bigger picture as well. And that's, you know, instead of dumbing down our publications in order to fit into a PDF, we can open them up to new connections. I mean, our James Minahan logbook, of course, is going to be linked out to resources in a range of different cultural heritage institutions, to Tro, to the National Archives, there's all sorts of stuff. We can move from PDFs to portals. What I want is historical narratives to be contextually and critically rich gateways to our cultural heritage collections. Every publication should be a finding aid. I want publications that are not just the final output of a research process, but starting points for many journeys of online discovery. And there's some cool, other cool developments, things like web mentions and linked, open, uh, linked data notifications um, that makes it conceivable that cultural heritage institutions could be alerted when their collection items are used in these sorts of contexts. And they could then retrieve the linked open data, the nice open structured data, grab the web page, parse the, parse the data out, and ingest it into their own systems. Collections would then become embedded within a structured web of scholarship and storytelling. Okay, it's not gonna happen quickly, but that's all right. Stay tuned for the next installment in about six years time. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, and I should say that I did share these slides via the NDF Twitter stream if you wanna grab the, the links in it. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions, if there are any questions. Kia ora, Michael. Hi, Michael. Uh, it's on. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the pipeline of, of data got here? You, you showed a little bit of the, the, the markup, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of authoring environments and, and writing this. So there are two, two aspects. One's just an ease of use of how easy is it, is it to write something like this if you were doing documentation? But there's also the aspect of how, how are you getting the data into this, that yep. last jump? Yep. Um, so um, I, th I sort of wanted to leave it as open as possible in terms of um, possibilities for getting uh, the data in. So um, in terms of what it expects to see in, term in terms of the, and it can either, it'll either Jekyll will pick up automatically either JSON or YAML. Um, so that's the sort of format it's expecting. And then within that, my plugin expects things to have at least a, a, um, a schema.org name and type. Uh, and so that's the sort of very base level requirements. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, conceivably, as I said, at the moment, our data for James Minahan is just sitting in Google Sheets because that was what, it was easiest for Kate and her research assistant to be plugging stuff into. Um, and, um, and it's you know, easy enough just to get the CSV and, um, and process, just do a little manipulation of that to get it in, in YAML. So, I mean, there's a custom script involved there, but you know, um, it could, you know, I could set up a sort of shared Google sheet with a standard script, which would enable people to go down that route if that's what they were interested in. Similarly, I've got some templates which use Airtable, so you could, uh, which is you know a cloud-based database thing, so you could actually use that, put stuff in there. They've got a nice API, I can pull that out fairly easily and uh, make it available. So um, I'm trying not to uh, say that this is the, the, the method that you should use for creating the data. Um, but leave it as open as possible. Um, and this may be, again, because I'm just lazy. Um, and, uh, but um, uh, again, I, but I did want it to be 
simple and, and as much as possible uh, to be built around uh, people's research practices rather than saying, well, this is the technology, this is the way you have to do things. Um, in terms of the text, the self, the narrative text itself, well, you know, you can just write it in Microsoft Word and then use Pandoc to get a, a markdown output um, and add in the tags. So that's, that's, that's pretty straightforward too. Hi, Siobhan. Hello. Have you <laughs> we finally met. <laughs> yes. I, well, well, we'll get to talk later. I'll come stalk you later. Um, the, have you seen the work that JSTOR Labs have been doing? Um, they uh, recently... JSTOR Labs. Um, they're reimagining a monograph, and when they did that project, um, I was my brain was exploded basically <laughs> by it, and it just seems very similar to the type of work you're doing here. And I was wondering if you could comment further if you know that work. And uh, no, I don't. But you see, I always said somebody else would do it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they haven't actually done it. They've just explored the possibility, uh. and it was about yeah the the same th it, this uh, very similar themes. Mm are uh, shrieking from both these um, projects that you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, no, I haven't seen that one in particular, but um, yeah, I mean, certainly um, there's a few of uh, these sort of reimagining exercises going on around the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think there's one, is it University College London? Or one of those UK institutions too is, is developing a new sort of scholarly publishing platform. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned Scalar, mm. um, which you know, enables you to have that sort of uh, uh, non-linear narrative and rich media and that sort of thing embedded within your publication. Um, they, they also did an uh, original project right at the start um, about Zam the uh, Zambezi expedition, <laughs> which pulled in a whole load of research from and images and specimens, yeah. it, it just blew my mind. And yeah, 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 yeah. I just wish more people were doing this. Yeah, and this Manifold is a new one, yeah. um, which similarly enables you to sort of have those sort of, uh, you know, very media, media objects uh, yeah. uh, with your text as well. So I think there's lots in that space. Mm. Um, and um, maybe I'm stupid for doing my own thing, but um, I do sort of think it's, I mean, what I'm trying to do is, act, like I said, it's sort of simpler, really. I mm. mean, I, and I still do want to have the, the sort of narrative text mm. at the foreground, mm. um, <clears throat> but have those sort of other layers as well. Mm. Um, you know, and I think there's some value in um, scaling these things back to simple I agree, processes. I agree, I'd love to be able to do it, and I don't know how. So. Yeah, I mean, I look at something like Manifold and it looks really cool and then there's like, you know, the installation instructions are about that long mm. and you've got to set up your server and you've got to have all this sort of stuff and they'll send somebody out for a day to help you install it and do all this sort of thing and I think, oh, I don't really want to do all that. Mm. And then it comes back to those preservation issues as well, which I also think are important Yes. Um, in terms of, you know, designing new platforms. How do we sustain publishing platforms mm. over time, which means that the thing's actually going to be readable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. I was just wondering if your uh, the Jekyll pipeline, you could add in extra checks like the linter, um, and and to check that the links resolve, you know, in external links, that kind of stuff. So yeah. you could kind of make the pipeline more robust. Is that absolutely? Possible? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yep. No reason why you couldn't. I mean, you know, there's good uh, Jekyll's built on Ruby. There's good libraries, uh, you know, linked up in other libraries for for Ruby, which enable you to do that. I mean, I do need to. Um, it, you know, it does a little bit of checking just in terms of the sort of structure of the data, obviously, in order to make it work. But there's no reason why you couldn't do more like that. And the other thing, I mean, the other thing too, about it, which I haven't got in. I mean, obviously, you know, as you're doing it, you're going to be linking out to uh, you know other identifiers for the different things as well, so whether they be in wiki data or anywhere else. Um, and you know, the other part of the theme, which I haven't put in, would be you know pulling stuff back at the load time using JavaScript in order to display material from those sources as well to integrate it further and to make that stuff available. Um, but that's, I see that as sort of a presentation part of it um, rather than just you know, you're defining the relationships in the data and then having those preservation, presentation possibilities. Kia ora, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, I have to admit, 
It's great to see a lot of my team here because, um, and they will tell you that I've been a bit cynical about linked open data and how much focus there is on getting the tech perfect and right. But what you've done for me today is actually show how it's useful and the point about uh, historical narratives being to be contextual rich gateways to our collections and actually seeing an example of that has been a bit of an aha moment for me. So thank you. Take note, team. Um, and <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, how much, Paki Paki, for some.